sociologically, because we're setting the stage for another Holocaust. Why am I concerned about that? Because I know from prophecy that Jesus Christ, when, when the disciples came to him privately and said, how will we know when you're coming back? And he gives them that two-chapter private, there were actually four, four of them, uh, Peter, James, and John, and Andrew came to him privately. And it's recorded in Mark 13, Matthew 24, and Luke 21, the two chapters in each case, that so-called Olivet Discourse. He points out that there will be a time of trouble such as the world had never seen to that time or ever would see again. He's quoting there from Daniel, the book of Daniel. And his remark gives that period of time its label among Bible scholars, the so-called Great Tribulation. You and I throw that, if you're in prophecy studies, we throw that remark around all the time, the Great Tribulation. Where are we getting that? From Christ's quotation of Daniel in, in Matthew 24 and 25. What's the focus of the Tribulation? Not the world at large. The Old Testament has a synonym for that. It calls it the time of Jacob's trouble. Israel is set for a time of trouble that was never seen to that day or ever would be seen again, and that day is yet future. That means that Israel is being set up for something that will make the time in Germany look like a picnic. And what's setting the stage for that is the theology that's starting to pervade what you and I would call the denominational Christian church. And what's amazing about this is it's so unbiblical in 17 other ways that you're amazed that biblically fundamental people can embrace these ideas, especially since we have 1900 years of church history to look back on and realize the errors that it leads to. Now, we don't have time to go through the whole thing. I want you to be alerted to it. I want you to keep your antenna up. I want you to keep your commitments to theology cautious and tested by the Scripture. Because if I'm correct, we're moving into an era in which we're going to be challenged. Most people that are hearing my voice on tape or whatever may not have the benefit of a biblically sound environment like you and I enjoy here. I'd be very surprised if any of this grabs any, you know, can take any root here. But it is taking root in some amazing congregations I have, have knowledge of. Therefore, you want your caution flag flying. And if I'm right, this is not just one of these theological fads that come and go. There's dozens of them by dozens of names. They happen not to be my particular concern. This one does, because I think it's prophetically relevant. And if I'm right, it's setting the stage for 2 Thessalonians 2. It's setting the stage for the lie. I'd like you to turn with me to Ezekiel 36. I'm going to take just one dimension of the so-called dominion theology or kingdom now theology, and that's its dealing with Israel. And not only do I want to remind you that the promises to Israel throughout the Scripture, throughout the Torah, and certainly throughout Ezekiel, pertain to Israel as it sits in the land. But I want to call your attention to the way the Lord talks about it to Israel. God is going to keep His promises to Israel, not because Israel deserves it. I want, there's, this occurs several places in the Scripture, but I've chosen Ezekiel 36. I'd like you to pick up with me. Well, incidentally, let's just start to take the first couple of verses to give you the flavor of the chapter. It's talking about the restoration of Israel to the land. Chapter 36, verse 1. Also thou son of man, prophesy unto the mountains of Israel, and say, Ye mountains of Israel, hear ye the word of the Lord. This is typical Ezekiel style, if you're familiar with Ezekiel. Verse 2. Thus saith the Lord God, because the enemy hath said against you, Aha! Even the ancient high places are ours in possession. So there's a claim, a claim on the land. Sound like front page stuff, doesn't it? We'll skip ahead in this, and it talks about the whole fact that God has, has his hand in Israel, and a lot, a lot of interesting things are going to have. Pick it up by verse 17. Son of man, when the house of Israel dwelt in their own land, they defiled it by their own way and by their doings. Their way was before me as the uncleanness of a defiled woman. This is God talking about Israel. He's talking about blessing them in their land. But in this passage, he's calling their attention to the fact that when they were here before, they offended him. Israel doesn't have any glowing history of faithfulness to God throughout the Old Testament. We saw the wilderness thing. There's the whole history of Israel is one of failure of all kinds. And God's calling their attention to it in verse 17. Look what happens when you get down to verse 21. God is saying, but I had pity for Israel. 
No. For I had pity for my holy name, which the house of Israel had profaned among the nations, to which they went. Therefore say unto the house of Israel, Thus saith the Lord God, I do not this for your sakes. Do not what? Bring them back in the land and glorify them. He's not doing it because Israel's so faithful. He's not doing it because they're so great. He says, I do not this for your sakes, O house of Israel, but for my holy namesake, which ye have profaned among the nations to which ye went. And I will sanctify my great name, which was profaned among the nations, which ye have profaned in the midst of them. And the nations shall know that I am the Lord, saith the Lord God, when I shall be sanctified in you before their eyes. When you study Ezekiel 36, which is obviously the prelude to Ezekiel 38, and you know all that, the thing that you can miss as you go through Ezekiel is that God is not going to bring Israel back in the land and keep these promises because they earned it. Quite the contrary. He describes in 36 and 37 that they'll be brought back into the land but in unbelief. And they are there. They're secular humanists. Deep passion for human rights and all that. I'm not knocking them, but they're not there, except for some fringe groups. They're not there as an obedience to the command of God. And God is saying, I am going to fulfill my promises, not because you deserve it, but because those promises were made before the world. And the world knows I made those promises, and I'm going to keep them for my namesake, not yours. So when God wipes out five sixths of the Soviet forces moving into Israel, it isn't because Israel's so neat. It's because God is going to demonstrate in Ezekiel 38 and 39 that He is going to keep His promises that He made to this ancient people. We go through the whole thing. God is going to visibly move in your lifetime and mine, maybe in the next several years, certainly in the next decade or two, clearly visibly, to deal with Israel. And He's doing it not because Israel's right, not because they're faithful, not because of anything about them at all. He says, historically you grieved me, You've profaned my name among the nations that you were sent. They haven't been some kind of pillar of witness to the existence of Almighty God. He's going to keep His promises because the world knows He made those promises. And He's doing it for His name's sake. And I don't think He's going to mess around. Now, when the Christian church starts to weave a theme that Israel is an imposter in the land they really don't have these claims. That's not the Israel that God talks about. The promises of Israel really come upon the church. And they start getting that all muddied up. It scares me to death. Not only because it's wrong and it'll cause error, but they're setting the stage for the great apostasy of the end times. The apostasy that the New Testament talks about. The apostasy that the Old Testament talks about. The apostasy that not only will be an apostasy vis-a-vis -vis a, a, a departure from a saving faith in Jesus Christ, but an apostasy which will lead to the lie which itself will be a fulfillment of prophecy that Jesus Christ and the other and the, and the writers of the epistles and so forth speak so eloquently of. So I, I call your attention to that because A, it's coming. It's not only a heresy, but it's prophetically a cornerstone. In fact, probably the last missing piece in the scenario is surfacing and is visible. And I call it to your attention because it's secret. There are going to be some books published. There are, fortunately for the body of Christ, some fairly outspoken people who will mention name names and do the right research to do this properly, so I'm not about to get into that here tonight. But be prepared to be startled and shocked by the kinds of people who are common household names in the Christian community who are secretly espousing this theology and are uh, going to mislead and, and uh, injure the body of Christ. So I'll leave that with you. Now, we got through Jude 5. Next time, we got Jude 6. <laughs> and I've been looking forward to this, because this gives me a license to get into the spookiest stuff you can imagine. Now, those of you that have been with me for some years know that I'm capable of some really weird views. And so um, next time we're going to get into some strange things. We're going to talk about the angels who kept not their first estate, but left.